Thank you very much, uh, Jagjeet, for this very kind invitation. It's um, really a pleasure to be in Liverpool again and uh, share my work, this time in a bit more depth. Uh, we were all together at the Blue Coat Gallery in November, so I feel like this is uh, another chapter of the story. Um, I um, would like to share uh, three projects that um, I want to talk about today. But I feel it's important to talk about the space and the milieu in which um, my work has been produced. Um, because I feel work isn't produced in a vacuum. And by that I mean that it's not a work that's made in isolation. Um, and as so many of you artists and otherwise know, um, you know, it's really, art is, it does require a certain kind of solitude. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the generative space that's create that one needs and the kind of conditions that one needs to make work is often the impetus of the work itself. So um, I find that often in, in these spaces, um, the work often becomes a reaction to a particular kind of space, um, a, po a political uh, space, and also um, the kind of cultural space that we occupy. And I want to think about a little bit about what that kind of space is for us. Um, and here I would like to talk about my own context. Um, and in so doing, I would like to also consider uh, for us living in Britain, in a city like Liverpool, what are the kinds of questions and what's our relationship to a community and a city, um, which often instigates us to write the poems that we write, to make the kind of music we make, and also to respond to the political rights and grievances of our lives. So, um, to share three projects uh, that have evolved over a number of years, um, I, I think it's interesting because these specific projects also talk about my broader concerns as an art practitioner. The first is The Journey We Never Made, uh, which is a work in progress. And it investigates the fabrication and aesthetics of urban craft production in pockets of small scale workshops in Karachi and its surrounding areas. Uh, so I'm sort of really using this uh, presentation as a way to unpick and critique the process and problematics that are set up within this project. Um, as a background, I'd like to give a brief history and uh, give you a sense of the current scale of logistics uh, that sort of um, are part of the Karachi Harbour in order to situate the coordinates um, of Karachi's historic, economic and strategic location. Um, I think this will give you a sense of the scale and the acceleration of the port activity because Karachi is a port city and also show the bandwidth of operations that take place in this region within which a lot of my work and this project is situated. So Karachi is a city, um, it's a teeming meg megapolis of over 21 million people. It has a diverse demographic and is the financial hub of the country. Uh, the port has a strategic importance to none other than Afghanistan, which is a landlocked country. And I'll highlight three points of historical importance which have impacted the level of logistical operations in the history of the Karachi port. Um, I quote here, concerned with about Russian incursions in the area, the British East India Company conquered the port of Karachi in 1839, recognizing the potential importance of the port of Karachi as a military base and as an export port. The British developed the harbor for shipping and laid the foundations for municipal government and infrastructure. So this was something that was um, really concerning the East India Company in the middle, early part of the 19th century. Um, with these developments, the town began to go quick, quickly and in 1843, Karachi was annexed into the British Indian Empire. The British recognized the importance of Karachi port and in 1856, the opening of the harbour was deepened and widened to accommodate the flow of vessels entering the harbour. With the events leading up to the independence of India and the partition of the subcontinent in 1947, 
Pakistan's strategic importance post-independence is echoed in a precise analysis of Field Marshal Montgomery, who was the chief of the Imperial General Staff, and he noted, I quote, the Indus Valley, Western Punjab and Balochistan are vital to any strategic plans for the defense of the all-important Muslim belt. The oil supplies of the Middle East, if the British Commonwealth and the United States of America are to be in a position of, to defend their vital interests in the Middle East, then the best and most stable area from which to conduct this defense is from the Pakistan territory. Pakistan is the keystone of the strategic arc of the wide and vulnerable waters of the Indian Ocean. So this is an interesting um, comment uh, made, um, you know, over a hundred years ago, I suppose, or, or actually around the time of the partition. Um, and one last um, important uh, period in the expansion and logistics of Karachi port has been during the mobilization of goods in wartime. And I talk here about the US and NATO troops and uh, Afghanistan post 9-11. Uh, and it's really the level of cargo that increased during the surge in American and NATO troops, which were stationed in Afghanistan. And as one observer commented, um, US and allied troops require a Herculean mass of supplies from ammunition to toothbrushes, fuel, night vision goggles, even with the containerized packing systems and all the technology that made in US, say, delivery systems have made available to the military, the traffic volumes are immense. So to tell you the scale of this um, strategic uh, sort of movement of supplies, in 2008, nearly 30,000 containers were sent to the front, or about 75% of the total need in fuel, food, equipment, and construction materials. Traffic reportedly doubled in 2009, and the requirement for 2010 will likely double again. Obviously, this report is a little dated, but, um, and a lot has happened since then. But I think these images sort of tell you a little bit of the experience, actually the physical experience of seeing containers, oil tankers piled up in traffic jams and queues trying to get across the, from the port of Karachi uh, up into the hinterland and across the border into Afghanistan. And I, I'm showing these images because these are sort of everyday images that we see, we experience, we get stuck in traffic jams, and often when you're driving to the beach for your Sunday uh, you know, picnic, you are stuck between 40 to 100 tankers, which are in a queue too, and you're sort of weaving your way through these. Um, so this, this uh, last point, uh, in brief, recounts the dynamics of Karachi port history uh, and um, is the current expansion of cargo and infrastructure facilities that the Chinese are building in Karachi and Gawadar ports, known as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Um, so CPAC sits within the larger, expansive Chinese project of the Belt and Road Initiative the BRI project. And this is a sort of revival of the new Silk Road, China's vision for globalization. And according to one article, it uh, costs one, it co the BRI is a 1.3 trillion doll US dollar Chinese led initiative program, creating a web of infrastructure, including roads, railways, telecommunication, energy pipelines and ports. Behind the rhetoric of harmony and mutuality lies a substantive strategy for growing an emerging China-led operating system for the international um, community economy. And so this map shows how China will construct a network originating from Kashgar in China's uh, Xinjiang province in the far northwest of the country that borders Mongolia, Russia, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan and Pakistan and actually stretches all the way to the port of Rotterdam, which is where I was last week looking at the port logistics of, of that city. Um, so, I mean, I'm sort of just wanted to give you just a, like a, something in a nutshell to give you a sense of what the city of Karachi's uh, history has been, um, what its port means uh, to, um, has meant through history and through the East India Company, um, 200 years of uh, colonialism, as well as um, further on into the 
occupation of um, Afghanistan by American and NATO forces since the last sort of 25 years. And so it's really within this kind of landscape of geopolitics that my little project, The Journey We Never Made, sort of began. Um, and actually, to tell you a bit about this, um, my long-term engagement with uh, this project sort of starts from my uh, time in, a, in an island called Manora, which lies in Karachi Harbor. And uh, this sort of, um, the work really resembles a sort of a form of tourism. And I've taken hundreds of photographs and collected inexpensive souvenirs, most notably small handmade boats covered in shells and sold in souvenir shops by the sea. This is a photograph of um, a small souvenir stall on the island. So this process of collecting objects and photographs has been part of a really a long-term archival approach to the way I've looked at the island of Manora. So my research for this project started in early 2016, when I began to think about the rapid change in form and shape of these boats that were sold in the souvenir markets along the seaside. They became more intricate and sophisticated, some double-story houseboats, while others had verses from the Quran drawn into them with small shells. There seemed to be more than incidental shifts in their fabrication, a strong impulse that seemed to connect these boats to the changes in the city and its demography, or the hands through which they were made. They were embedded with an anonymous language and rhythm of their fabricator. The souvenir, for me in a sense, marked a personal moment and an expression of collective memory for both the producer as well as the consumer. And so every time I would walk through the island, I would pick up a small boat or two. And this happened really across a period of 10 years. So after a while, I realized my studio was littered with small boats of varying sizes and different kinds of sensibilities. And so the form of vessels changed. And um, you know some looked like boats from the Spanish Armada. And they carried a sort of almost like a, a spiritual symbolism and also sort of a future imaginary about uh, what kinds of aspirations people had when they bought something like this. And um, I also felt that the objects carried really the tastes and shifting aspirations of the consumer market. Um, in his essay on urban craft culture, Iftikhar Dadi discusses in depth the way in which these low-tech craft urban objects transform in relation to the um, public space, which is really constantly in flux. So the souvenir objects are made by artisans and they pass through several stages of production in informal factories, such as the ones in these images, factories and small workshops. They are finally decorated with tiny shells from the ocean, which are collected in large quantities. The souvenir factories, um, up until recently, used to employ female labor. The women would work in their homes and produce up to a thousand boats each day. I discovered in my conversations with one of the owners of the workshop, Wali Bhai on the left, that um, uh, you know, he often gets bulk orders from merchants based in Bandar Abbas, which is a port city in Iran, about 1500 kilometers from the Makran coastal highway, um, which is in Pakistan. So really, for me, this was an attempt to find ways to work with the artisans and understand their methods and modes of construction, and also the impulse that lay behind their aesthetic choices. So um, the work consists of um, a series of model vessels made by local artisans. The sources of these new vessels included my personal archive of photographs taken in Karachi Harbor over the last 10 years, as I mentioned and um, as well as historical vessels which marked the Indian Ocean. And I selected specific image as images of bulk carriers, fishing trawlers, um, and historical vessels. These images, uh, photographs, were turned into line drawings and scaled down um, and then fabricated by model and souvenir makers. Each craftsman had taken the individual line drawings um, and interpreted them in terms of their own form and aesthetic. And so the process of adjusting the size of these vessels into the miniature souvenir scale created a sort of object of intimacy, like a toy that can occupy an imaginary state through a child's eyes. 
The scaling brings them into this intimate scale of consciousness. And um, also, I think, you know, the size uh, in a way acknowledges the disproportionate scale of global containers in contrast with local vessels that ply the ocean trade routes. I worked between different artisans and workshops. Yusuf, who lived on Manora Island, repaired and produced musical instruments. Krishan Babu was the keeper of the Hindu temple. Walibhai was a fact owned a factory in the Kurangi industrial area in Karachi. Each of these workshop spaces had a different approach and relationship to their work. This meant that much of my intervention to use images of specific vessels was really translated, lost and retold through the adaptive nature of the person working on them. Um, so really there's, there was a sort of perception of scale and hierarchy of the vessel and what it meant, what kind of materials were used. And really, I was anxious to find a way to set up the possibility to intervene and not to really control the narrative and the outcomes of what was produced. And, um, you know, what interested me also was the loss of identification and a kind of rescripting of the narrative um, that, that um, came across the original boats and vessel images that I'd given. And I found that the artisans wrapped a different kind of narrative around how they thought about history as well as place, as well as what these images meant to me. Because of course they inhabited, um, you know, they inhabited the coastal areas and they often saw these vessels, um, you know, sort of moving across the ocean in front of them. So um, in a sense, um, you know, these uh, vessels um, for me have a kind of sense of a meta commentary. Uh, and, and, and a kind of uh, relationship with historical narratives of land as well as maritime history. And um, this is just another image of, of another boat. And so, you know, just the way that the shrine is placed on top of, you know, this little podium um, was, was, was something that obviously was not scripted by myself. Um, So these, these boats were um, installed in vitrines and uh, you know, each, each object had its original boat name and year scripted um, onto the vitrine so that you could see it as a sort of title or as a, as a, as a, as a kind of pin that was, that was marking what that boat was and where it, what date it had been photographed or documented. Um, and so, um, yeah. So really working uh, between different artisans and workshops meant that much of uh, you know, my intervention was translated. And I felt that what was interesting um, was also to see how um, this, these objects, which were really kind of invested with multiple layers of production, could offer different kinds of narratives um, in terms of ideas of scale, in terms of history, and also economies of production. And uh, over the years, I've uh, worked with um, different um, uh, communities of artisans. And this is not uncommon amongst artists in South Asia, um, because a lot of production of objects and sculpture work happens in collaboration and there's a wealth of specialized artisanal workmanship that uh, contemporary artists employ. Uh, but I realized over a period of time in my engagement with artisans that whenever I worked with a welder or a caster, I found that the ideas and the technical possibilities that they created and they offered were really, um, really exciting. And, 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 and that space was often more interesting than the work that I was producing there in the first place. So kind of these were questions about collaborations that were raised in that, in that process. Um, so before I show um, a short a sort of bit of the video uh, work that I'd like to share next, um, I would like to give you a background um, 
because I feel that, you know, most of what I'm showing is uh, interlinked uh, within my work in an organic and, and in critical way. And um, these ideas really talk about terrain and the material presence of land. Um, and so a lot of what I've done has emerged out of a long engagement with the island of Manora. And it lies, this island lies within the harbor of, um, of, of the port of Karachi. And you can sort of see the tip of it, the point of it, uh, sort of um, stretching out in the center of, of this map. Um, and um, so really, um, to tell you a little bit about this island, from the 18th century onward, onwards, Manora had served as a defense fort, uh, as an outpost facing the Arabian Sea. And it forms a part of a small archipelago just off the natural harbor of Karachi. And um, so it's very close to the city of Karachi. And um, it kind of, just like the city, it, the island also bears traces of the multi-religious and heterogeneous space of pre-partition South Asia. Um, over the years, however, I've witnessed a particular kind of development, resulting in the slow erasure of both the history and the natural ecology of the island. Um, there's a nexus of military and commercial interests that have led to the radical disenfranchisement of Manora's local population. However, uh, the land itself rendered in a sort of state of ruin, I suppose, um, and ruinous built structures, uh, keeps pulling me back into its kind of materiality. And in a sense, uh, for me, the island evokes the metaphor of a body that has been gutted and cast away. So the experience of, uh, really the physical experience of walking has underpinned the conception and production of much of my work. The idea of walking or reflective journeying is also a way to engage one's creative self without deterrence. And over the last 10 years, I've been revisiting the same sites, investigating built structures around me through a range of media, drawings, video work, sculpture, photography, and prints. And through walking, I explore these art uh, architectonic ruins um, and also the public, the nature of public space that surrounds such sites. Uh, these are a series of um, sort of projected installation, um, a project called Marurio's Fossil, which comes out of um, a story of a, of a Sufi poem from the early 18th century. Um, so walking the city or the island becomes really also a kind of insertion of the female body um, as an intervention in public space, and it becomes a way to reclaim that space. And um, also, I suppose, uh, it's, uh, it's a critique of the gender-divided and ethnically fractured streets of Karachi. If you have been to South Asia, you would understand perhaps the sense of that fracture and what it means, uh, where space is often quite gendered and um, segregated. So to enact the city in a bodily way is really also to create an, a visual archive with a sense of forgotten and outcast narratives of the land, um, narratives of post-colonial and post-partition history. Um, I'll just move on through these images and just let you see a little bit of some of the work that I've produced. Um, and really, I think um, I sort of, um, keep coming back to the same sites. I photographed the same uh, temple, the same structures which are under, dem you know, marked for demolition. And, um, you know, I've tra traveled back and, and what I find is that images and objects really travel back and forth within my work. Um, and sort of what happens is that they kind of resurface and connect to new contexts that I'm looking at and what I'm exploring. Um, so I'd like to just uh, show you a short uh, clip of the video, the observatory, which um, I think comes up after these few images and um, tell you a little bit about the, the, this film. Um, I sort of, the film also comes out of this space of the island, um, which has been a really generative space for me. Um, yeah. And um, 
So in the observatory, the narrator voices weather reports from the India Weather Review, 1939 of storms and depressions across British India. And this historical document of weather reports takes on a different tone when it's mapped onto the current decay and ruin of the decapitated um, observatory building on, on the island. Um, and it's kind of interesting because the specificity of the text uh, is, is kind of strangely intimate. But at the same time, um, it's an example of the dichotomy between imperial mapping and everyday lived reality that you feel um, in, in a city like Karachi, you know, which is, which is um, kind of a rupture of, of that uh, space. And hopefully I'll be able to pull this out for you and just give you a sense of a few minutes of this video. Jakhoda, Jansi, 31st January, heavy hail storm, key day. Storm lasted 90 minutes, many cattle and birds killed. Concord District, 1st March, afternoon, hail storm. Damage to crops, hundreds of birds killed. Amritsar, Hisar, Gurgaon, Lalpur District, 5th March, Hailstorm. Crops of wheat, Senti, Chakral, and Toria destroyed. Sodar, Sotanaki, 5th March, Hailstorm. One day, 11 head of cattle and a large number of birds killed. Dibrugar, Assam, 12th March, evening, hailstorm. Several houses collapsed, trees uprooted, electric wires damaged. Sinhet, Assam, 17th March, evening, thunderstorm. 1,000 square miles ahead. Trains held up. Colombo, 29th March, night, thunderstorm. Several districts plunged in darkness. 400 telephones out of action. Mysore district. 6th March, thunderstorm, one day, two huts burned down by lightning, two calves and two goats killed. Mehapur Nadia, 6th May, day, three dead, many houses demolished, mango jack food and lychee crops damaged. Calcutta, 7th May, Evening. Norwester thunderstorm. First Norwester of the year. Temperature fell by 18 degrees. Wind velocity reached 74 miles per hour. Overhead electric cables blown down. Trolley guns, Hora, and Kosovo plunged in darkness. Country craft capsized and sank in the booty. Siliguri, North Bengal, 20th May. Morning. Thunderstorm. One day. Three coolies working in the Bagdadia tea estate struck by lightning. One of them died. Chittagong. 13th May. Night. Thunderstorm. Two dead. One severely burnt. Viramgaon. Endaba. 31st May. Night. Day. One. Okay, this is about 12 minutes long, so I'm not going to play all of it. Um, and um, I, I think for me, the, the, the text opened up a space and a narrative um, and a geography of a much larger terrain. 
And um, it was this sort of disrupted landscape within the building, uh, which was for me a kind of metaphor for the disruption on a much larger scale. Um, the, the, the 1939 was pre-partition. So if you imagine the map of India, um, you know, the land was, was one country. And so um, sort of recounting this, um, the, you know, the classification of weather, of storms and cyclones, uh, and of course the classification in these weather reports were developed by the British as a form of classification and, and you know, the obsession of that classification came out in so many ways. Um, so these notebooks were found in this building. But when, 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 when I sort of pulled, pulled it out and started reading it, I realized that, you know, this was a completely different kind of terrain and there were places that I I hadn't been to, um, you know, Chittagong, where my mother was born, for example, I'd never been to and probably may not be able to go to. And sort of vice versa, people in India would not be able to visit Lahore. And so there was this kind of obviously dividing line which created a sense of, of the disruption on a geographical level, which, you know, 70 years down still uh, resonates. Um, and also, I think, kind of uh, formally re reconstructing that internal volume through the ruins and the debris of, of that building was, was really the single narrative of the work. Um, and, and I wanted to give the viewer a sense of being submerged. Um, but by pinpointing a particular moment in history, I wanted to consider the challenges of presenting that history and reflect um, you know, on, the, on the subjectivity of how we remember something. Um, through this sort of long-term engagement with a specific place, I realized that this work carried a sense of atmosphere that had to do with light and atmosp atmospherics of a particular place. And so, um, you know, uh, this idea of this interest of, of looking at weather history um, is really something that I'm, I'm researching right now. And I just want to briefly mention um, uh, this in a few through a couple of images, because I feel that we forget that weather landscape is is a form of a landscape which is alongside the maritime landscape and the urban landscape that we talk about and that we experience. Um, and I'm exploring kind of at the moment moments of cultural rupture of historical rupture, uh, which specifically point to or anti-colonial struggles in places like Africa and Asia. And I'm sort of interested in mapping space through weather archives at really specific moments in history and, and specific locations. So I just, I just wanted to sort of mention that. Um, and of course, it takes me back to Manora. And, and, and this is the first kind of shot that I took, which is about thinking about recounting weather history in specific locations because the island for me has really become a space of incubation for ideas over you know, the course of many years, um, where you know, many ideas have, have, have taken a root and, uh, you know, and um, even though my own location shifts, there's a kind of critical relationship to the idea of land and the ocean and, and its ecology. So um, I'm going to sort of move through these images and really um, move to, to um, the next bit of what I'd like to share. Um, and I feel what, what's also interesting is to talk about how knowledge pools, um, you know, how as an artist, um, you know, we build knowledge um, and how um, that, um, you know, practice uh, evolves in relation to a specific place, but also um, is, is, is often sourced through an interdisciplinary sort of um, pool of, of, of ideas. Um, and I, I'd like to mention here, because I think through my research, I've kind of felt like I've engaged with, with my welder, had conversations with in fringe communities, with, with urban theorists and, you know, the establishment, because Manora itself is is, is, is a naval installation. So I've kind of engaged with people within the Naval Academy to talk about, you know, what, what sort of space they envision on the island. Um, and so this sort of uh, idea of, of how, you know, uh, research uh, 
has become an observation point which really a, kind of informs broader uh, ideas uh, is something that I feel I should mention. Um, I'm currently um, sort of at the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths and you know I scribble down some notes which I feel bring me back to examine what I've been doing and one of these um, sort of um, lecture notes was and I quote what if power operates by changing the form of the earth beneath our feet and I found this intriguing because I've been really thinking about this idea of building terrain and thinking about the land under our feet and um, I've also you know linked to this question is, is, is another question which is how is space capitalized and how is capital spatialized and um, this sort of takes me back again into a, a, a kind of rabbit hole of historical research, I suppose, um, which you know is more linked to notions of spatial segregation within the post-colonial city, and also you know how we um, how how to challenge and confront conditions that produce um, you know what we live with in contemporary life, and how you know you experience a city. Um, and and I, and I think it's interesting to think about this, um, you know, through imagery, but also through um, how you experience, um, you know, a city like Karachi, which is layered with so many different sort of histories. So um, uh, these, these images are a little bit of current research um, in terms of looking at um, sort of the spatial segregation of, of uh, factories and um, you know looking at um, company paintings from the Dutch East India uh, archives as well as the East India archives. But I will not uh, talk so much about that um, except that uh, you know th these, these are some of the ideas that um, are absorbing and taking up um, my time. Um, you know the the last thing that I would uh, present and I think we are sort of running short of time so perhaps I won't go into henna hands Jai if you don't mind and I'll just um, sort of um, talk about the gesture of the speech act which I'd like to uh, recount for the last five minutes of this talk um, so I've been working with historical texts uh, in which I felt you know even in the observatory video you know there's a sense of a time and a rhythm and the way that information is tabulated um, and so this historical sort of classification in a sense is the primary motive of this data but um, for my own personal uh, sort of tabulation of uh, place and moment um, I pulled together um, field notes from uh, my time in Menorah and I started thinking about collating them into something which uh, gave a sense of place as well. And I'll probably end by, um, you know, just reading a little bit um, about that and, and perhaps skip some of the other things that I would have liked to share. So, um, just another five minutes of, of this and and then perhaps we can, yeah, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. 24th December 2008, Karachi. The public boat costs 30 rupees and is packed like sardines before it leaves the pier at Kemadi. I now realize why the seagulls are hovering above our boat. As we cross the water body, they swoop to catch the small pieces of unbaked dough thrown by passengers into the sky. It is a frame of cinematic proportions. Second April, 2009, Karachi. I've been thinking about locational works, performance, a way to mark the body of this island. 13th December 2009, Menorah. 
Many of the visitors who come to Manora often make a long journey from the inner city towards the open sea. For a mere 20 rupees, the Durbin Walas on Manora Beach offer customers a view through their handmade, homemade telescopes. They direct our gaze to sites that are not visible to the naked eye. 18th December 2009, Karachi. It is extremely difficult to position myself as an artist in this context and think about how to create work in which I can mark a protest in the face of the establishment. 13th January 2010, Manora. I arrive on the jetty during Friday prayers. As I walk through the compound, I hear loud microphones, two sermons from two mosques. I stand in the confluence of these sound waves, looking at a laundry line strung across the middle of this rubble-strewn opening. The dripping laundry is oddly composed of garments in all shades of red. 20th April 2010, Manora. Looking at the photograph of the burqa-clad Baloch women walking along the sea, it occurred to me that an image could aspire to mythical proportions. This photograph seems to hold a space that does not quite exist. The duality of the elements that make up this image relocate this space where time is compressed and stretched simultaneously. The land and sea become both a single mass and interchangeable. In this way, they carry equal proportions of meaning. This is, this is not a landscape. It is about the moving image, an extension of temporality. Our spaces in Manora gendered. 24th July 2011, London. Picking up the snow globe of Big Ben, I was thinking what kind of snow globe could be created for Manora, a souvenir of the island and what it stands for. The link between the snow globe and the island is the element of water. The liquid in the globe is the horizon contained, endlessly fluid but fluidity contained, packaged and commodified, and with it, time and memory. The snow globe has within it the potential for both fixity and fluidity, an imagined world, a promised utopia. 2nd July 2012, Tehran. Tehran is a new and complex sensation. The familiarity with a place is not the map we use to get around, but the map of a city as it unfolds in our mind. 24th August 2012, Karachi. The steamboat marooned in the Indus Delta, the whale beached on Karachi's shore, each unhinged from its source of origin to find a new abode, to find its slow death or its new beginning. 2nd April 2013, Manora. Sitting at Miss Nawab's cafe on the edge of the ocean, Maha and I discussed the possibility of the Manora book. Formulating working methods, the archive becomes open, discursive. The island a generative space, imagining a social geography, the entanglement of the land and the sea. 17th April 2013, Manora. Each time I come to the island now, I am checked by naval intelligence. The Commodore has betrayed us with his sense of romance about the island and its potential. They do not want to acknowledge the multi-religious history of this space. The temple, the shrine, the church, the lighthouse, these have become censored sites. The landscape is visually marked by the violence that is yet to claim them. 12th December 2014, Amsterdam. I'm looking at the clusters of cracked porcelain and pepper found in the wreck of the Dutch East India Company trading vessel. The language of these forms create another vocabulary of sorts. A kind of compression occurs. I see the shipwreck as a process, a sort of agent of time and transformation. Continuous time. Objects can join and make another kind of object memory-bound objects. 12th April 2015, London. Land hunger. Each day I hear about more boats crossing the Mediterranean Sea. How many bodies can be absorbed in the space of the ocean? 
17th October 2016, New York. After watching Liquid Traces, The Left to Die Boat by Pisani and Heller, I cannot think about the ocean as I did before. A sea of impunity, the ocean bed, a mass grave, Europe's amnesia, the VOC ships, a cargo liner, a refugee boat, a life raft. Each vessel represents a particular power structure of imperialism and its afterlife. Fourteenth December, two thousand and sixteen, Amsterdam. I seem to be coming back again and again to the broken cracked porcelain and the company paintings at the Rijksmuseum. There is a strange dichotomy between these untroubled images of the company paintings and the violence in the broken objects, their patterns of life and foliage disrupted by the shipwreck, unhinged. Objects from the depth of the ocean, the object, beached, in sand, in mud, in time, in history, anchored in its own awkward politics of loss and con conflict. That's it. Okay. Right. I think I should end there. <laughs> There's a lot more to talk about, but uh, I think I just gave half of what I wanted to share, <laughs> which is probably enough. Thank you so much. Um, home can be in two places, I think. Um, I feel that way. I mean, uh, you know, it's, um, I guess it's, for me, it's, uh, it's very much about um, kind of having the experience of both places, which are both very influential and, you know, that kind of driving my ideas and my life in both personal and professional ways. So I find that both those spaces are quite distinct. Um, you know, Karachi's cultural life um, has been really important, you know, for 25 years to invest time and the sense of community that it has. And I think, um, you know, as you said, you know, living in London and Oxford was, was a very formative time of my, my, my work and my life. So, you know, coming back to London, I think it's, it's very much like coming back to home as well. So, I mean, it's, there is a duality, there is a kind of straddling of both, you know, universes, I suppose. I feel very much like that. Um, it's not a singular sort of sense of where one belongs. And there's the naval you know, installation there, and then tourism. And how, how do they kind of interact with <coughs> separate? Mm. That's, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I mean, it's a very militarized space. You know, you, you find that in many places. I was in San Francisco, and we drove through a space where, you know, you just had a very militarized space of homes for the vet war veterans. And, and, you know, it was kind of gated. But I mean, in Manora, I, th I think it's very distinct. It's, it, it's so distinct because um, the sort of, um, um, th the way that the space is marked physically um, between the civilian part and the, the, the Naval Academy is, is very distinct. And of course, these zones are kept quite separate and, and uh, you know, gated and, um, there are all kinds of things. Um, 
and and it, and also I think the personnel from the Naval Academy don't really mix very much with the civilian population. Um, so once I was sitting in a cafe, and I bumped into some of the naval officers, and they were women, and they were you know they wear white saris in, in, as part of their uniform, and I sort of invited them to come and sit and have a cup of tea with me, and they didn't. And maybe they couldn't because, you know, their sort of protocol is to keep uh, a sort of sense of uh, distance from, you know, the kind of life of the island, the other life of the island. But in its physical capacity, it's very distinct because obviously the Navy has a lot of uh, resources and so they maintain the buildings and the markings of, of signage and everything very up to date whereas the civilian part which is under the jurisdiction of um, another board municipal board it's a bit like you know merton council or wandsworth council or whatever so you know they, they have a very different budget and you find the you know that discrepancy is very visually marked in the terrain in in the way that you know buildings are falling apart or you know the the civic amenities are not there and you know, then you have the Karachi Port Trust, which is another um, judicial body of, of, of governing certain parts of the, 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 the island. And again, it's really different. So it's, it's kind of interesting in such a small area to see, you know, this sort of demarcation of space. And, and if you walk up to the lighthouse and you look down into the island, you really see all these different patches, you know, of, of green spots where there's water to water the gardens of the, you know, the Port Trust um, sort of uh, staff high ups. And then you have really barren bits of land which are not. So it's, it's kind of that visual demarcation is, is, is really interesting. Um, last week with, in London with the, you know, burst water pipes and stuff, there were people on the radio talking about how, you know, Croydon and Streatham felt like third world countries because there were like about 12,000 homes without water in London because of the snow melt. Um, and somebody said, you know, we were carrying water on our head. I mean, obviously that was an exaggeration, but it was an interesting sort of visual parallel about how, you know, the terrain is so uneven in a place like London where people are privileged and also really, you know, sort of left to sort of find their own means of survival in a sense, in the barest sense at that point. Um, but yeah, I, I think, um, you know, you really, really see the terrain and the unevenness of it. Hmm. Yeah. It would have been interesting to have seen the drawings. And then you have the Marconi symbol. Mm. And then a set of drawings. How do those relate to the lady in the Yeah, I, I'm sorry I didn't talk very much about that. Um, but I think I just felt like it would uh, be a very, um, it would be a bit of a imposition on the, on everyone to, um, um, so the drawings for the boats, um, I mean, um, I didn't do a lot of drawings except for something like this, which was more, um, you know, kind of conceptualizing where these boats would be, how they would sit in vitrines, like in a maritime museum. So these were very small drawings, which just sort of give me a sense of the feel of what I wanted to create eventually. Um, these drawings where the, you know, the, 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 the vessel from the photograph, you know, what we did was we pulled out, I worked with a small team of people, including the artisans and, 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 and young, one, one or two young artists. And so a vessel like this, you know, we researched what its tonnage would be, uh, what its measurements would be uh, in terms of, um, you know, um, archived logs of these large cargo ships and, and they're all online. And then once we'd worked out, um, you know, the, 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 the measurements, we scaled everything down according to the same scale. So these drawings were really 
made um, very simply and in a very linear way to answer your question. Um, what happened with this project was that I was working simultaneously on drawings which um, were um, sort of um, really, really, um, let me just try and pull this down. Yeah, I was working simultaneously on a series of drawings which kind of were inspired by this whole process of working with the artisans. And I, I can't really pinpoint how these were inspired by, but they happened after the boats were made. And so I felt like the, the language of the drawings was quite hybrid and the, the way that these images kind of came together was, was quite interesting. Some of them were, I mean, there are a lot more actually. Um, there are about 12 drawings of different kinds of vessels. Um, so that's, that's the, perhaps the way I could answer your question about the drawings. And then the Marconi loop, is that what you were mentioning? These ones up here? Um, wh was it these drawings? So really there were, not, there, there were no drawings that visualized the finished product in terms of the journey we never made because the artisans were making things and you know I would go and sit and talk to them and we'd sort of realize oh my god this has gone out of scale but you know that was things moved in all kinds of directions. So there were no drawings that I made that Yeah. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah, um, this is really. Yeah, this is really interesting. I mean, I've lived with this image now for like over a decade, I think. And um, I'm glad you picked up on this. I found um, the almanac, um, the nautical almanac 1966 which was again in the observatory building, uh, along with you know, lots and lots of other handwritten ledgers from the early 20th century and um, the, 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 the report of storms and cyclones in the Indian Ocean from 1939. And so this was in a manual called um, the Nautical Almanac uh, from 1966. And you know, the almanac was sent, I mean, after partition and after the Second World War, obviously, you know, Britain had to keep an eye on, on, on Southeast Asia and there was this kind of um, paranoia about Russia and, you know, communism. And so all of these, I think, um, ways of archiving and uh, these sort of selling surveillance equipment basically back to, um, all, all of the countries in South Asia and Southeast Asia was probably, you know, you can probably find these almanacs, you know, in every port city in, 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 in Asia. Um, so, so these were advertisements um, and they were, in the beginning of the almanac, there were like about 20 pages of advertisements. Um, and this is one of them. And uh, d different advertisements selling life rafts, selling archival space in, Clare House in England so that all the mapping that happened um, probably by the Pakistan Navy after 1947, all those documents probably went physically went back and were archived and sent Clare House in London somewhere or outside London. Um, and so, I mean, I was really fascinated with the language, the graphic language of these advertisements and there are many. Um, and what I did was I created a, I made a, a project in which um, I use some of these um, these pages, and basically it's called Secrets from the Nautical Almanac, and I, I I can't show it to you because I haven't put it in this PowerPoint. But you know, it it um, it uh, th this this nar this almanac was actually uh, eaten up by bookworm when I found it, and then I scanned those those pages. Um, but what I did was I um, used the idea of bookworm as a sort of, you know, narrative of its, uh, on its own sort of time meter. And um, there were words which were encrypted into the, into the form or language that a bookworm might use. Um, and these narratives were from, um, you know, 1950s, 60s political rhetoric about, um, you know, it's like when Ayub Khan met Charles de Gaulle 
you know, he said things like, um, well, um, if we are prosperous, you will be prosperous. You know, there were, there, there's, it's fascinating, you know, you see these video clips on YouTube, you can find them. So, you know, he's saying that if we are prosperous in Asia or Pakistan or South Asia, it'll be good for you as well. So, you know, let, let us be prosperous economically, let us be robust, let us not be perhaps subservient to whatever, and let us get on with our policies, domestic and international. Obviously, you know, that didn't happen. But I sort of encrypted these, these narratives which, which are cut into the pages um, of, um, of relief prints um, and um, etchings which, which basically mirror the same sort of pattern of the pages. But they're sort of laser cut into it. You can't really see it in here, but there's a little bit of that. So really, the, this, this image, um, you know, became something really interesting because it was in itself encrypted because you had this sense of looking through these binoculars and in the bigger sort of loop you have sea power which was obviously what was what won you know the first world war and here you have a little plane coming in which is the kind of supremacy of air power um, and you know i was just fascinated with this 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 um, this so it became the template for, uh, you know, a number of images that I reconstructed through my own photographs that I w was taking at that time. Um, these are the dude beans, the homemade telescopes on the beach that I mentioned. And then later on, you know, these sort of images of land formation, terraforming. And actually, this is one of the deep sea terminals that the Chinese is building on Karachi's port. Um, it's not on the port, it's very much on the civilian part of the land. Um, and it's a coal terminal which touches the land um, in part of a city which has got some of the most expensive, you know, flats and um, residential sort of area property. So, I mean, yeah, this, this, is, this is something which is just ongoing for me. I, 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 the video that you saw of, um, you know, the, the thing also sort of comes in the form of these um, these sort of um, idea of looking through something, the lens of something, you know, producing other kinds of images, but also relationships of images, yeah. So there's kind of things interwoven between this Marconi image. The building is in Aldwych, it's a very big building. It still exists, Marconi Company. And so, you know, I have to write to them and ask them to fund me to do something <laughs> because I'm using their... It's also the form of uh, the Lorenz attractor, isn't it? The weather. Sorry? You know, in Chaos Theory, the Lorenz attractor, mm. the form of the weather. Yeah. It's the same. Okay. You know, to relate to your own weather. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And how there's been eroded or, you know, similar kind of things. You, know, you make parallels with different locations in, from Menorah to London and New York and so on. And lots of churches here, for example, that get turned into mosques and so on. And then you mentioned property development and so on. Hmm. So, you know, I presume you're. What I'm trying to get at is, do you think there's a shift away from that plura plurality in Pakistan, in Karachi, or do you think it's getting less singular? I think it's, it's definitely getting more. I mean, you can look at Karachi or you can look at uh, South Asia as an example. Um, of what's happening probably, you know, many places in the world. Um, and you, you, I mean, I think you, you don't even have to create that axis on the axis of religion. You can just create it on the axis of difference, um, of race, of ethnicity. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, um, you know, obviously partition created, uh, you know, the separation on religious lines. And so many cities, um, you know, became polarized and, you know, you had, 
cities which co you know communities coexisted and you had one part of its community extracted and le the other half of was left to reconstruct and rehabilitate itself that happened in india in many cities it happened in pakistan as well it happened in bengal um, and yeah, so in Karachi also, as you know, when I talk about this sort of imprint of or the ghost of like a post-colonial, you know, the erasure of it and what remains as part of it, um, you see that very much. I mean, you you see that in terms of the minorities and in terms of the way um, you know d different communities, um, you know, the, the imbalance within the larger community and. And, and, you know, that sort of sense of, you know, tolerance of, of otherness uh, gets lost. Um, it, it's interesting because we were talking about this in relationship to, um, in relationship to um, Israel and Palestine. And I was reading something by this Egyptian author where she writes that, you know, in Cairo in the in, 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 in the 40s, uh, when, when Israel became established, you know, the, the community in Cairo was, 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 was um, yeah, so, um, so sort of torn because they said, but Cairo has been Coptic Christian, it's been Jewish, it's been Muslim, it's been all of these different things. And, and, and so if all the Jews leave the city, what's going to happen to our city, you know? Um, and, and I, as, when I think about that in terms of, of South Asia as well, you know, Bombay, for example, was also like Karachi, very, very, you know, multi-ethnic, multi-religious. And so, you know, the, the cultural life of, of that city was infused by all these different communities. Um, and that has also flattened out in places like Bombay and same in Karachi. So, yeah, that, that you know, you don't realize that, you know, you're creating something, but what do you leave behind? You're, you're leaving a vacuum, which is going to be filled by something. And, you know, that something is, is often very mono, um, sort of theist, mono, religious, mono, you know, not very tolerant sometimes. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>